Welcome to the BMW 640i Gran Turismo review. Now that you've seen the exterior montage, you might be wondering, much like I was, what is this thing? Why are they making it? And the more that I've driven it, the more it makes sense. It's a sedan turned hatchback. It gives you all the practicality of a smaller SUV or CUV, but in a car format and it drives like a car in and out. So let's start looking at the interior space. Any day now. There, now we can get a bit more intimate on the interior of the 640i. And this is a mix between a 5 and a 7 series, more like a 5 series, which means it is a great place to be. This trim level has the M Sport package, which gives you a lot of the fluff makes you feel like you're in an M car, but it's not an M car. You have the side sills. When you enable sport mode, there's an M on the gauge cluster and there's an M badging on the wheels. Now, I'm not gonna mislead you. This is a luxury car. This is a grand touring machine. At no point do you ever feel like this is a sports car, but it is extremely comfortable and isolated. And that's the biggest thing. No picture or video is going to explain just how quiet this space is. You have to get in it to drive it, to believe it and appreciate it. When you open all the doors, the hatch, the hood, there's a level of solidity in this car. And granted, there's only 2,500 miles on it, but there's not one creak or rattle in here. I can't speak to the future, but right now it is pretty impressive. When you close the door, you just have to close it a little bit it will electronically latch itself. And you might think, well, isn't that gonna break or is it completely unnecessary? That's kind of what this car is about. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you don't need in here, but once you have it, it's hard to go back to anything else. The interior space, the ambient lighting that can change colors based on a program in the infotainment screen. You can change it based on your interior color to, to purple or lilac to orange. And the lighting is a big thing about this. The HVAC controls and all the lights in here are kind of white during the day. And at night it goes amber to reduce eye strain. The screens for the most part are extremely dim. They have good black levels, so it's not overly annoying during night driving. Now all the other materials and touch points in here are kind of what you expect at the price point. The alloy materials, the glossy wood trim, the stitching and the way that the dashboard is contoured, the center stack design, the knee areas padded, the armrests are padded properly. Everything looks and feels extremely well put together, including the headliner and side sills. Now, one of the better parts of BMW cars, and I talked about this in the X3, is the physical control structure. The center stack design with the HVAC controls are tremendous. They are completely isolated from the infotainment, which means if you have the screen off or the screen breaks, you can still use the HVAC controls. It tells you exactly what the temperature is down here and all the buttons have great tactile feedback, including the, the buttons on the steering wheel. Your paddles on the car don't click so loud that it annoys the passenger when you're using them. And this is one of the best things that BMW does. There's a lot of thought to design here. Now BMW didn't get everything right because there's way too much shiny black plastic on everything. On the steering wheel, which is all full of fingerprints and smudges. Uh, it's on the left side, it's on the center stack, which right now in this light, all I see is fingerprints, dust, skin. Uh, it's all over the center stack where your shifter is. It looks dirty all the time and that's my problem. If you're really anal about keeping your car clean, this is gonna drive you nuts. The second negative part is this center console area. The armrest doesn't have a ton of space to store stuff. And this center area where your cup holders are at has this high tension spring loaded door that is kind of like, it's easy to kind of get stuff stuck in here and it's jammed a couple times on me. And the worst part is it has a wireless charger here for your phone and a USB port that is right by where your cup holders are, including your 12 volt charger. Now, unless you're transporting cups with no liquids in it, this is a huge, I don't know why they did it this way. You're definitely gonna spill liquids in here and I can't imagine it lasting too long. Now it's time to talk about technology. And this is kind of a repeat of what I did in the X3 video, so you might wanna see that. But the infotainment, the gauge cluster, and the driver assistance package is something that BMW touts. And the infotainment in this vehicle is one of the best in any car that you're gonna find. And a lot of that has to do with 
BMW is one of the first to develop this, and they've continued putting a lot of money and time into the user interface, the speed, and usability of it. When you get into this car at any point in time, it's ready to go. There's no delay. There's no lag. There's no annoyances with things connecting. The music plays right away. It's just something that you don't see in a lot of cars. That's a huge pro. The negatives are still there. There's a steep learning curve to understanding how to get in and out of all the menus and all the things that it controls. But here's the things that I didn't talk about in the other video. The first is gesture control. BMW implements this on some of their vehicles and you can do things like this. Throw up a peace sign where it will forward the track or you can go into the gesture menu to choose what you want it to do. And it works really well if you put it in the right location. Like you can put it up here, but you know, your arm's stretched out and you're gonna get tendonitis. Uh, the sensors are basically po pointed down towards the center console. So if you do something like this, you can raise and lower the volume, which is really handy once you get used to it. Now, because the ergonomics are so good in here, it's easy to turn the volume knob. The volume buttons and switches are on the steering wheel are totally functional, so it's just an added feature. The second thing that BMW allows you to do is to save favorites for certain menu functions. Like I'm talking about how there's so many menus to find something, it's really annoying. When you first get in here to learn it, it's like, dude, why do I have to, you need to go to a class to learn all this stuff. But like the HUD, I hate having the HUD on. So you go to the HUD menu, you go to the menu that says turn it on and off, and you hold down your, your radio presets, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, and you hold it down to the function you want to program. Long press it, when you press it again, it just a one touch toggle certain functions on and off. And I really like that, and it's super intuitive. And you know, for the most part, you're not gonna go in and out of all this stuff once you have it set up, but it's nice that it's there. Now, there are other things in here like tracking your location, sending anonymous information back to BMW from like driving habits or vehicle performance. All those boxes are checked by default and you've got to go in there and uncheck them. Again, it's one of those things you don't know what they're sending out through their telematics system, but everything else works extremely good in here. The next thing to talk about is BMW's full LCD gauge cluster. And this does not have any physical gauges, but they are smart and include physical bezels on it around the primary gauges and the fuel gauge and the temperature gauge, which gives you that three-dimensional feel like they are real. And for the most part, when you're driving it during the day, you don't even notice that it's an LCD panel. Black levels are good for the most part. They're not the best, but the graphical interface on it is really, really good, and it's super simple. There's some minor customization you can do when you go through your menu structure, you switch your drive modes, it can change the way that it displays, but I think most people are really going to enjoy it, and I've had almost zero problems with it aside, well, of course, when and if it breaks. All right, let's talk about interior comfort, space and all that. Unless you are a straight-up farm animal, you are gonna fit in here with no problem. There's a ton of leg room in the back, in the front. Just, you always feel like there's room to grow in here. The back seats recline electronically, uh, and the front seats have just enough adjustment to get you kind of set up and comfortable. And when with the memory settings and the different driver settings, clearly you can set this up how, for however you want it, but that's one of the biggest pros of this. Comfortable, quietness, and solidity. Now, one of the biggest arguments against the Gran Turismo is its styling. The rear end is so bulbous and awkward. Until you open up this hatchback and realize when you fold down these seats electronically, this is an absolute cavern. It's bigger than some studio apartments in major cities. And this is going to completely end the argument that people are having at home about, well, I, I don't want a sedan because the, the trunk is too awkward. I can't fit my dog food in there. I'm going to blow out my back. No. Now you don't have to choose between a CUV and a sedan. This combines all of those things together. And when you add in the air suspension that raises and lowers itself, the comfort, the luxury, the sportiness of it, it's a weird vehicle for sure, but I think a lot of people are gonna connect with this. Let's head this beast into the shop and take a look at the underpinnings and then take it for a drive. Welcome to the In the Shop segment with the BMW 640i on the Benpack lift. Now I'm a major proponent to understanding what goes into a vehicle before you get behind the wheel because it helps you to understand what's going on behind the scenes. And in a lot of cars, SUVs, trucks, 
some of this doesn't much matter anymore. Everything is just so canned and mass produced. This BMW, I've spent some time driving it before I got under here. And let me tell you, this is a real treat. And of course, at this price point, you'd expect some cute little things that you're going to notice. So let's get right into it. Now in the front end, there's some things to talk about. And one of the things you notice right away is there's aluminum everything here. And that was a purpose in designing this. They want to reduce weight. They want to reduce unsprung weight. So you have aluminum lower control arms, an aluminum fork, your knuckle design, your upright design, your upper A arm. This entire structure is all aluminum, including the subframe and this skid plate. You have kickups on the dust brake shield that have you know, they're kind of brake ducts that just blow air, but it helps to cool off the brakes. Now, this is a double wishbone suspension that has air ride suspension, which combines the shock and the spring together. And what you'll notice all around here is you have a dual ball joint setup, which helps with more direct steering and more rigidity throughout this whole structure. And this is an extremely smooth uh, under panel. This under tray here directs airflow almost all the way back. The only thing that really kind of gets in the way is the exhaust system, but you have extensive use of undercoating, body coating material to reduce noise. There is almost no bare metal anywhere on here and you can see the coating and it's not just in the places you see, it's just the entire substructure of this car. So if the front end of this BMW didn't impress you, don't worry, the back has a lot more action. Starting with airflow, the continuation through the side panels, through these plastic panels, over this X brace or subframe brace on the back that's all aluminum. You have these large plastic covers that guide air over the rear subframe, the lower control arms out towards the back of this vehicle. And this, the coefficient of drag on this vehicle is really low for what it is. The next part is you have an aluminum subframe and that's not typically something you see in the back of most cars. It's usually stamped steel. Uh, the lower control arms are stamped steel, but this is a multi-link design, a five-point multi-link design. And your, but you're going back to your knuckle design, it's all aluminum. Your dust shields for your brake rotors are also aluminum. But the biggest thing back here that you're going to notice is the extensive use or the continued extensive use of body adhesives or uh, undercoating on most of this car. And a lot of this design and most of the design philosophy here is reducing vibration road noise. You're going to see vibration dampers, all these little tricks that they do to reduce road noise, drivetrain vibration into the cabin. And when we take the drive on this car, you're going to, I'm going to talk about that a lot. There's felt on the inner liners of the fender wells to help isolate and reduce road noise. There's just little accents all over the place. Now it's time to talk about the mechanical aspects in the rear of the 640i. And the first thing you're gonna notice is this is an all-wheel drive setup, and that's the only way that you can get it. Now, this isn't some front-wheel drive monster with all-wheel drive added on. This is a rear-wheel drive platform first, so you're gonna notice that in the driving dynamics. The second thing you're gonna notice is these massive air shocks, which include the air springs and the piggybacked reservoirs. Now, this entire suspension is one of the biggest highlights here, and this is why you have to understand this before you drive it. The entire suspension is adaptive or proactive. It can raise and lower itself. So it can raise itself up to 20 millimeters for ground clearance or in sport motor at higher speeds over like 75 miles an hour, it will lower itself 10 millimeters. The other thing that it will do is when you choose adaptive mode, the car will literally look at GPS data, your navigation data to see what the road conditions are like ahead. So if there's turns coming up or elevation, it can preactively set the suspension, the ride height, the damping, all of that to set it up before you get into the turns. And that's just remarkable and it does work extremely well. Now, the dampers are made by vibroacoustics or vibroacoustic, and they make shocks, they make isolation and vibration dampers like engine mounts, which some of those you're gonna see here. And the second OEM that you're gonna see is this has rear wheel steering. It has a rear wheel steering module that is made by ZF. Now, this steering module is directly controlled to the stamped uh, toe arm or lower control arm, and it will move itself in and out to help you steer. And the most noticeable aspect of steering this, you feel the rear steering, is in a parking lot condition. If you start cranking that wheel, you start to feel the rear end turning and it's the most strange feeling. But once you get used to it, it's unbelievable how this thing turns. And it, it's a big aspect of driving this. 
the last part mechanically you're going to see is this guy. And at first it looks like, well, is that a huge vibration damper? No, it's an active sway bar. This is your electric motor or well, an electric assembly that helps to torsionally load and unload the sway bar to change. It's again, it's a part of the adaptive suspension system. And all of this working together is a huge pro and con of this BMW. Because the first thing I'm going to tell you is this is a vehicle that I would absolutely lease and be extremely happy with it. If you're gonna buy this, you're gonna buy it out of warranty, you take a look at all these individual models, or modules rather, and you're gonna look at the cost. You're gonna look at the cost of replacing subframe parts or aluminum chassis parts in an accident. It's gonna cost you a lot more to repair and replace a lot of this. The shocks on here are gonna cost you three times as much as just a regular you know, non-adjustable damper, special electronic damper. So all of this stuff does add up and that's why the price point of this vehicle is a lot more money. So if you go into that understanding this, while it's amazing, it's not gonna be so amazing if it breaks and you have to pay for it out of pocket. Now before I go under the hood to talk about the engine, this is yet another BMW that I've put on the wheel scales that has completely surprised me. And I don't know why, because it's part of their engineering philosophy. Balance. It's got a 50-50 weight distribution, front to rear and side to side. And what that translates into is just such a connected driving experience. Now, the other half of this equation is what's under the hood. This turbocharged inline six that has a twin scroll turbo is so utterly smooth and refined. It's ridiculous, really, and it spoils you so much when you drive this that going back to a regular car is difficult to do. And part of it is you get that massive thrust from the start from the turbo, and then it winds out like a naturally aspirated motor. It just goes all the way to 7,000 RPMs without any hesitation, timing being pulled, any type of weirdness in performance, and it's one of the best attributes to driving this. We're gonna, I'm going to talk about that more in the driving experience, but everything else here, isolation, sound isolation, you have reinforced strut or shock towers in this case. It's just a really seemingly well put together front end. I'm setting off in the BMW 640i, and I'm going to say something right up front. If you took 100 people and you put them in a four-cylinder car, I don't care if it has 60 turbos on it, and then you put them in here with the inline six, 99 out of 100 times, those people are going to say, give me the inline six or six-cylinder any day of the week over a four-popper. And that's because of the level of refinement and the performance and just how it feels to drive. It's one of those intangibles about driving a car that most people don't think about. How does it feel? How does it respond? The overall just quality of the driving experience. The biggest thing about this BMW that you can't put into words is its level of solidity, its level of quality, refinement, and isolation from the road surface. You're not going to get into too many cars, you know, you're not going to get into too many cars, period, that feels as solid as in, in just so refined and isolated as this. And it's not just a fluke. It's one of those things that they've built into the car, the level of quality and the aluminum, the bushings, the isolators, the way that the subframes are mounted, the suspension setup, the air suspension, the programming, all of that leads to something that feels, I mean, I just can't, sometimes you can't put a price tag on that and that's what this is about. 
yes, the biggest negative part about this BMW is the price. And you just look at it and you're like, how could anybody spend $80,000 on a vehicle like this? And then you really think about it, you drive it for a little bit, and it makes a lot more sense. It makes sense in a way that you can't explain until you get over pavement like this. The air suspension, I drive it in Comfort Plus all the time, and it soaks up every bump without feeling trashy, without feeling overly sloppy, and the programming of all this is good enough to control, even you can put it in Comfort or Comfort Plus all the time, and the suspension and programming is smart enough to know I'm going to give you a little less body roll and it can adjust the sway bar, it, it can adjust the damping rates, it's always looking ahead to see how it can keep this riding perfect. Now you might think, with a vehicle like this that's so comfortable, so isolated, that it doesn't have any performance. And that's where I'm completely surprised by this. If you bring this down to a stop and you put it in sport, and after you put it in sport, you turn the traction and stability control off as much as it will allow you to do that. Put it in manual mode, torque, you know, brake torque the car, get the RPMs up so the turbo spools It's really, really good. And this is more power than I would say pretty much anybody needs for the road. And it's not trying to do it. It's not trying to fake you out and be like, oh, this is a sports car. It has sports car levels of performance for most people. And then of course, <laughs> it has the ride quality of a pure luxury car. And that's one of the best parts about it. And it's rear biased. So if you peg it, you're still gonna get the rear bias that you want. And that's one of the best parts about driving this is it doesn't feel like overly safe or it doesn't feel like you're constantly gonna plow or it's dialing back the power and the suspension to keep you safe all the time. You have a bunch of different modes here to kind of set it up the way that you wanna set it up. If you wanna ride in comfort all day long like a pure cruiser, you can do that and then you can turn it into kind of a sports car experience and that's one of the funnest parts about driving this. The transmission performance for a torque converted eight speed is a nine. Uh, the engine performance is easily an eight or a nine. It's more than most anybody's gonna be able to use. The suspension setup is about as good as you can possibly get for a car that you're actually going to drive every day to utilize on bad pavement, good pavement, and still wanna go beat the hell out of it. It's easily a nine. You combine that with the chassis and all the thought to the engineering and balance and weight distribution, and all this, it's starting to sound like a commercial. But what I'm trying to say is sometimes you get what you pay for. And in this BMW, the combination of all these factors, including you know a 22, 23 mile per gallon fuel economy out of a car that I've been pounding around, it's really rewarding. If you can stomach the fact that you're gonna lease this and probably not gonna be able to afford to fix it at the end, I think this is one of the better like everyday driving cars that I've been in in a while. Final thoughts on the BMW 640i Gran Turismo. When I first saw this thing, I thought, there's no way I'm gonna like it. Just look at it. The awkwardness of the design, I don't know what it's trying to be. The more I drove it, the more I realized they did an extremely good job at combining the best facets of an SUV and a sedan. And it drives like a sedan, a luxury car, and that's the biggest part of this. And you're getting the utility that most people want. Between the storage, the room, the capacity, the silence on the interior, and the overall just comfort that you get, I really, really like driving this. In fact, I'd give it an eight or a nine across the board with every different aspect of it. Suspension, transmission, engine, 
And let me talk about that for a second. So many people are obsessed with the performance car segment. Well, what about an M car? Well, as a former owner of an M3, I'm gonna tell you one of the reasons why I sold it was, it still felt too much like a luxury car with an amazing motor and suspension. When I really wanted to pound it around, I'm like, you don't feel anything. Everything's stripped away from the experience. It's not visceral enough. I wanted something more hardcore, more edgy. I got into this and I thought, this is almost better than my old M3 because it's not trying to be anything other than a luxury car. It's got great performance. It's got great handling with the four wheel steering, the adjustable dampers, the, the air ride. Man, if you had to have a car that you could operate every day as a street car, it just doesn't get much better than this. I would take a look at it if you can get over some of the weirdness and styling and utility and just appreciate it for what it is because that's what I did. Take care, I'll see you next time.